First of all, I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Welly. Um, apologize for the weird setup because we cannot move this thing today, so I just have to deal with it for now. Um, my name is Welly Xiao. I'm a principal partner solution architect here at AWS. I will be your moderator today. Um, I heard that this is our first uh, KubeCon um, multi multi tenancy uh, conference, so this is also will be our first uh, panel session today. Um, the title of today is the Unlocking the Power of Multi-Tenancy. We're going to hear perspective from some of the platform leaders. So with that, I'm going to introduce our panel today. Uh, first of all, Mohan, Mohan Atreya. Uh, he's the Senior VP of Product and Solutions at Rafi Systems. Uh, Mohan, apparently also the author of the books around digital signatures. Uh, Mohan, I did not know about that, so that's uh, a new secret that I learned about you. Uh, he has extensive experience in Kubernetes, IEM, endpoints, and more. So, Mohan, welcome. Thanks for being here. And then next, uh, we have Prasidia Satyaye, principal SA um, on the AWS as well. Uh, my colleagues in here, she's based off Bay Area, right? Yep. Uh, she has uh, been focusing on helping a lot of customers in their cloud native journey into uh, AWS, of course, experts in Kubernetes, EKS, Fargate, ECS, and so much more. And last but not least, Ritas Patel, uh, the VP of product of Nirmata, and also the uh, co-founder at Nirmata. Uh, if you haven't heard about Nirmata, it's the uh, creator of the open source um, Kubernetes native policy uh, called Kiverno. And there's a couple of news that's announcement about Giverna today, so I was really excited about this. Uh, Ritas has more than 20 years experience um, delivering enterprise software and solutions. All right, so with that, that's the, uh, the, the, the panel for today. I'm gonna go ahead and start it, uh, the discussions in here. Sorry, gonna get my notes. Um, Mohan, I think this first question will be for you. Um, of course, today is the first multi-con, um, multi-tenancy con, and there's so much dimension that I hear so far uh, from the talk about the multi-multi-tenancy. Um, can you try to maybe help us kind of explain this when you, when you talk with the customers? Um, how you do? How you typically explain about multi-tenancies, and what are the trends that you're hearing from the customers? Sure, absolutely. Um, First of all, thank you for, um, this is a privilege, thank you um, for allowing me here. Um, so the question that Veli asked is an interesting one. And we saw some sessions earlier today where, especially the New York Times team, they showed how the, the journey, right? Um, you have an option one, which results in these pros and these cons. You have option two, then you have pros and cons. And uh, unfortunately, that's going to be the nature of, of any decision you make. Uh, there's going to be some positives, and it will drag you down in other ways. And some of these you can compensate through other, other mechanisms uh, to solve the problem. But in general, what we see customers attempt to do, they, they don't just start with Kubernetes, right? For them, the problem is a lot bigger. Uh, whenever I talk to customers, they start sometimes with the concept of even landing zones, right? Um, especially the bigger ones, to say, look, I'm going to have to create an environment for, for my application team. So maybe they start with landing zones. And if you are um, on AWS or Azure or you know, any other cloud, for that matter, you need these ways by which you can compartmentalize things. So multi-tenancy starts right there for them, right? And then goes even further. Uh, if I have, uh, do, do I create multiple VPCs or not? Uh, do I put everything in one? Do I have a flat network or not? And, and then things go even further and say, if I have like a managed hosted database, uh, do I have a shared database or not? Um, and only then Kubernetes comes into the picture. So as you can see here, Kubernetes and multi-tenancy, is nothing strange here, right? The problems we're seeing with multi-tenancy and Kubernetes, they exist in everything else, right? So the, the general philosophy that organizations align with is, Hey, I don't want something new and different, if possible, because then it's yet another thing that someone has to learn, yet, yet another thing that is different from everything else. They try and align across all these patterns they have. Uh, so 
the method that works for non-Kubernetes, can I, how far can I take it into Kubernetes? And at some point, of course, it'll stop, right? For example, there's no concept of a namespace in some, some of the other resources, right? Um, so th that's kind of what we see from customers. You know, they want ideally to deal with a known devil than an unknown angel, right? Like um, that's uh, easier for people to grok. Um, most organizations here, I'd be surprised if you're 100% only cloud native, you probably have a mixed environment, right? Some people have hybrid, some people might be multi-cloud, some straddling the world between VMs, maybe even mainframes, um, you know, then serverless and cloud native. Right? So all of these mixed environments. So how are you gonna make sense of all this? Um, so now having said that, when you talk about Kubernetes, since we're at KubeCon, we'll talk about Kubernetes, right? Uh, all of us heard about the standard patterns, you know, namespace as a service, cluster as a service. An interesting pattern we see from organizations is, can I be in between those two, right? I want the isolation that's possible with the namespace as a service, uh, but I don't want to be like in ticketing nightmare day in and day out, right? So I'll give an example. Uh, you know, we're dealing with uh, a large, one of the world's largest commercial real estate company. Um, they use Kubernetes extensively, and uh, they have an onerous ticketing process that they cannot get rid of. So if I'm a developer, and let's say I want a namespace with a certain quota, and let's say I made a mistake, right? I had to wait two more weeks for that ticket to be processed and go from X resources to Y resources. Right? So they want to get out of this ticketing business. So they have kind of found a spot in between namespace as a service and cluster as a service without the security compromise. So these are interesting patterns we're seeing where people are trying to find ways to avoid this ticketing nightmare, uh, the form filling, the constant changes, because no platform team wants to deal with this day in and day out. Right? You want as much automation as possible. So, these are patterns we see. Another pattern we're seeing every now and then is uh, if I give a tenant, what are all the uh, doors I can close right away? At the New York, team, uh, New York Times team talked about one or two of them, like namespace isolation, using Cilium as an example. We see that pattern quite a bit where they say, can I have a network policy on by default? Right? And then I'll start opening rather than having a model where everything is open by default and then I start locking. They go the other way, which is everything is shut by default, and then I open based on exceptions. So um, there's no one size fits all in a nutshell, but in general, there are time-tested patterns that we are publishing, that the industry is documenting. My recommendation is pick one of them, build on that, extend on it, contribute uh, if you can, and uh, uh, it just gets better with uh, more contributions. Uh, hope that helped. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mohan. I think uh, I am also picking up the story about like this is not only about Kubernetes. I think a lot of it is in Kubernetes, but then uh, some of those workloads also still need a database and other services outside of the uh, the Kubernetes itself. So maybe uh, this is a question for you, uh, Priscilla. Like you've been working with a lot of customers in in AWS, of course. Um, are there any best practice or architectural considerations when they thinking about multi-tenancy in Kubernetes in AWS. Sure. Uh, so thanks, Willy, for the introduction initially, and thanks, everyone, for attending this. Uh, yeah, definitely, uh, you know, like the best practices, what we see uh, from customer is exactly what Mohan said. One size doesn't fit all. So the architectural guidance and uh, uh, patterns around this also changes accordingly to the use cases, right? So we have seen, like, uh, at AWS, I work with the enterprise customers, strategic customers, and I've seen that they start from uh, the higher level, like the business unit level. And at that time, for them, the multi-tenancy is account. So they create multiple accounts, and they have the IAM uh, for the privilege access for the resources at that level, right? So that's one way. And that also helps to limit the blast radius, and plus it, the account limit issue, what we have. Uh, it also helps them in costing analysis because it's a different account, right? And then you go down the path, like Mohan said, uh, there are some platform teams within this uh, strategic customers who wants to use uh, best practice like namespace as a service, right? And then they use all the rest of the bells and whistles 
tools what we have for network policies, policy management, uh, anything around IRSA. As you mentioned, you have to talk to the other AWS services. You definitely need to control those resources, right? So, and then uh, we have also seen the usage of cross-plane. That's another thing, right? Uh, which is used actually to provision uh, different uh, AWS resources. So that's also into the practice. And then there are some customers uh, who wants to go for node-based provisioning, right? They use the auto-scaling group. Uh, we also have Carpenter, which is a new auto-scaler, uh, which also basically uses the node pool to provision according to, so that you can take your pods and put it in the nodes where you want, right? So that also gives you the uh, isolation. Uh, for all the ports in the node. <clears throat> and then uh, some people want hard multi-tenancy. And in that case, uh, they go for cluster uh, as a service, right? So each tenant gets one cluster. Uh, but then it adds to the cost, and then uh, maintenance is a nightmare sometimes, upgrade is a challenge. So few of our customers who are worried about these challenges, they say that, okay, is there any other solution? Uh, we are okay with uh, uh, not having like this much of workload. So for that, we suggest them the serverless option, which is Fargate, right? So they, it's a, like, uh, you don't need to maintain the servers over there, uh, no clusters. It's just like a serverless uh, container engine. So those are like different options we have from AWS, like where our customer uses for awesome. multi-tenancy. Awesome. Thanks Thanks so much, uh, Rosita. It's, it's kind of point out a lot of the uh, available tools out there. Um, and this may be a question to you, uh, Rites. Um, I keep hearing the challenges around data isolations uh, throughout the talk today. Um, and I think that's really important. There's, there's many ways we, uh, we can achieve this, but um, what are some of the techniques and maybe tools that you have seen work very well uh, when you're talking with the customers? Thanks, Wally. So yeah, so it, uh, one of the things about multi-tenancy, and if you go back and look at um, some of the history, right? Uh, in multi-tenancy in Kubernetes, implementing it, you know, uh, is, is fairly challenging, and you cannot kind of do it without automation, right? In the past, uh, there was always a trade-off between namespace as a service and clusters as a service. The one reason why somebody would use clusters as a service is because using a shared Kubernetes cluster with all of the multi-tenancy you know, guardrails in place was really hard. So uh, one of the things you saw, again, referring back to the New York Times um, uh, presentation, they talked about policy-driven security. And we see that a lot, policy-driven security and automation. So as part of the Kiverno community, uh, using Kiverno for multi-tenancy is, is one of the top use cases, right? Because Kiverno is a policy engine that not only can validate, but also mutate and generate resources. And that can trigger a slew of automation uh, to, to enable multi-tenancy in your clusters. So for example, you saw the, uh, the New York Teams write uh, uh, a controller, but that can a lot of that can be easily automated without having to write single line of code uh, through Kibarno. So going back to uh, you know the, the data isolation techniques you mentioned, obviously in Kubernetes you have the the control plane and you have the data plane, and isolating control plane uh, you know the techniques that are used, which we already talked about, namespace as a service. Uh, there's a project I believe uh, I'm not sure where it's at now, but there was hierarch hierarch hierarchical namespaces where you can have namespaces within namespaces. And then uh, also there was a kind of uh, an in-between, uh, you know, uh, virtual clusters, like weak clusters where it, it's, it's be, you get, uh, you know, you can actually have like cluster-wide resources, uh, you know, segmented across teams. So that's on the control plane side, but now we start looking at the data plane and then you start getting into some of the network isolation, which we already talked about, so I won't get into that. But the data isolation is uh, also very important, right? Like with uh, you know uh, uh, provisioning data dynamically, isolating uh, you know tenants using different storage classes, um, you know making sure that you know one application cannot use or access data from other application, and then there is a physical node level isolation, right? So if you have a cluster with a lot of different types of nodes, uh, you know you want to isolate you know say applications that want, that use GPUs only. Uh, on, on you know, nodes that have GPUs, you don't want to incur that cost. For other applications, that can be done, right? So all of these are different techniques, again. Um, there's obviously challenges in implementing it, and there are 
ways to overcome these challenges, you know, through some of these approaches like policy-driven security and automation. Thanks so much, Ritesh. Yeah, I think even in the data plans, like a role level security, the database these days has become more and more common and it's make it super easy as well, right, to kind of look at it. Um, I, I will have to say, like, certainly I see a lot of explosions in terms of the tools and technique um, when we talk about multi, multi tenancies. But since this is a, this is multicon, so this is our summit, I'd love to hear from all of the, uh, from all of the panels in here, like, what, what do you see as the future uh, in terms of like a multi-tenancy? Is there any top of the mind, maybe Prasita, you have something in mind? Sure. I would like to share one project of what uh, we have initiated from AWS called Canoe. Uh, this is uh, not only from AWS, but from our uh, like community partners like uh, and customers uh, like Salesforce, Adobe, uh, in, uh, I think Autodesk and Twilio. So it's called CNOE and it stands for Cloud Native Operational Excellence. Uh, so this project basically it takes or uh, it's kind of solves the decision making for the tooling uh, of CNCF. So a lot of people must be using, uh, you know, like Argo CD, Crossplane, uh, Backstage and everything. So this project basically brings everything together based on the best practices and the patterns, uh, what uh, our customers have worked on and bring it to you uh, so that you can use it. And we have the community support and it's driven uh, across like for uh, across our customers as well as the community. So that's one thing I want to share as a future. Awesome. Mohan, do you have anything in mind in terms like future state? Sure. Um, the, the pattern I see with, as with any other technology is um, things like this need to become invisible, right? They, it, it cannot be a very big, you know, you make a decision and then it should just be a checkbox and you're done, right? Um, and then how do you know whether the system is working for you or not? Because the pattern you choose may not be the best choice for you long term, right? Um, so the other thing that I see common from people is they go down one path, they realize after six months this is not the right path, they had to come back, try another path that's better suited for them for the next two years, right? So we see people asking the question very frequently, which is, I need to choose something that has two-way doors. So we go down this path, the cost of moving to another pattern should not be hyper expensive, right? And invasive um, uh, on the company. So these are the patterns we're seeing that people are trying something and moving to other patterns that are maybe better suited for them longer term. So, and the thing becomes invisible behind the scenes for them. Uh, thanks so much. Ritesh, do you have something in mind in terms like future state? Yeah, I think, I think obviously, you know, uh, from our perspective, uh, for a lot of this to be successful, it needs to be, um, you know, developer self-service, right? I mean, there's no, I mean, you talked about ticketing system and stuff like that. I mean, I think that's probably ancient, right? It's from our, the future is about, you know, doing things using things like GitOps, right? Model, using tools that developers are already used to, not kind of introducing more tools, but making sure the infrastructure is built in a way where it can, do things automatically with the right set of, you know, guardrails and governance in place, right? That's what we see as the future. Thanks so much. Um, I know I, I saw the, the, the time clock in the back. I think we are short on time in here. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's any questions from the audience to the panel, perhaps? Maybe we have one or two minutes. If not, I actually have one more question in, in, the, in that case, but let's see. Okay. Um, Maybe this is again for all, for all of you, like uh, in terms like recommendations for any new uh, organizations that just about to get started with multi, multi tenancies, what would be your, your first uh, maybe suggestion? Maybe we start with Mohan? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I, I would recommend start simple, right? Um, it, if you are new, brand new to the journey with Kubernetes, start simple. Uh, we, we tell people, look, it's okay to, for it to cost more money in the beginning, because you can always move from one pattern to another as you learn more. Your team has to have intimate knowledge of the Kubernetes landscape or you're gonna shoot yourself in the foot. So if you're new, start simple. It might cost you a little more. You can optimize later, right? So that would be our recommendation. Thank you so much, Ritesh. Prasida, you have any? Yeah, I would thought? say that uh, security is important. So least privilege principle to be applied for all your multi-tenants and start from there, generally like deny policy, and then from there on like uh, 
keep open it up for the tenants. Awesome. Rites, any last comments on that? Yeah, and just to add to both of these, I agree with you know both. Uh, and, and just to add to that, there's definitely a lot of proven models out there. So just don't, you know, just, I think just by doing some research, you should be able to get ideas of how others have successfully, you know, gone through their journey and, and settled on a model. Um, and, you know, if, if, if uh, you can avoid a lot of mistakes by, you know, following those, those patterns and paths. Thank you so much. I know we are running out of time, so thank you so much again for the panel in here. And also thanks for the audience. I hope that you all find this insightful. If you have any more questions, the panel will be around in here. Please give the applause to the panel here. Thank you so much. <laughs>